He said, no. I don't want you in Nashville. I don't want you in, in uh, Memphis. I need you in Memphis. This is a book that my uncle wrote called Sing Unto the Lord. And he started writing mainly when he was in the early 40s when we were having the, the wars. He wrote different things for the, uh, the soldiers. And then he started writing a lot of church music. So he ended up play, uh, doing like supplication, all kinds of prayers, and uh, doing the of the hymns of the church. So right now I'm gonna play, it won't be like his, but it be a song that he wrote. This is the second song he wrote. The first one he wrote, uh, it was mainly toward the soldiers, but this is a prayer that you can use in church in just about any, any service. It's called supplication. But I don't need the, uh, I don't need the book. I don't need it because I don't play by notes. Well, the beginning of the church started with the group like in Sec uh, Second Baptist uh, Fall Church and the Methodist Church. I think Warner Baptist, which is Billy's Crossroad, they all met in Fall Church in a little cavern. And uh, Second Baptist branched out to their own church. And Maryfield had organized, but they had not moved to any special place. But Mr. Bradley, who was a Methodist, they also met in this log cabin. So Mr. Bradley had bought properties up in Maryfield, and he built a building <clears throat> and asked the uh, like First Baptist members if they would you know, go into this building. So the building was not completely finished. So the members, which I think were the, like the digging board, the trustee board, all the men to help to build this structure. But uh, three years later, the, uh, <clears throat> the building was destroyed by a tornado. And it took them another, I don't know how many years to, to build, a total of eight years to rebuild it. But in the meantime, that they, they were building, rebuilding this building for the church. Uh, Jenny Vassell was telling me that they had it up to a, uh, you know, to a structure where they could go into it. The floors were not finished. There were the part of the floors that was finished. The older people used to sit there, but she was a young child at the time, and she would be sitting on the rafters of the floor, swinging her feet back and forth when the service was going on. And then later the building was finished, but Mr. Bradley did not deed or sell the property to Murphy. Then he let them use it, but later they bought it from him. But they had already organized First Baptist Church of Murphy, so you can't say that they weren't organized then because of the building. They went in, they used the building a long time before, uh, before Bradley sold it to them, but yet they were already organized. Unquestionably, religious institutions within the black community can never be overstated. This self-sufficiency through property ownership developed communities such as Maryfield. Additionally, landowners, churches, and religious institutions became imperative and led the way in providing protection from inequality. Maryfield, an area in Fairfax County where blacks created community, was named after the postmaster G.A.L. Maryfield. Prior to the Civil War, the area was once a rural intersection of land originally named Mills Crossing. Oral history states it was named after a free person of color who owned a sawmill. It was this place within the Providence District where whites, after the Civil War, would sell land to blacks. Local historians argue one half of those living within the boundaries of Maryfield were black. Of these black families, most had been enslaved. Many of these enslaved people now became the future landowners. However, this community was not was slow to flourish. 
Immediately after the Civil War, freedmen from rural areas of Fauquier County, contraband camps in Langley, McLean, Roosevelt Island, and Falls Church established permanent homes in McLean, Audrey's Corner, Lincolnville, and Falls Church. These initial founding fathers of African American communities established Second Baptist of Falls Church, Shiloh, Chesterbrook, First Baptist of Indiana, and Galloway Methodist Church. Many of these families later came to Merrifield or assisted in establishing this community. As the post-war progression, civil war, post-civil war progression continued, both land and tax values remained relatively low, providing an opportunity for black settlers to purchase land, mostly from ex-union officers such as Robert Porter and General Crocker. Joshua Fall purchased land from Robert Porter, which Rob Porter wrote his name after, um, on January 29, 1876, in the sum of $250. Harris, Horace Gibson, one of the largest landowners, is recorded as purchasing land as early as 1867, an additional acreage in 1871 from White's Porter, Robert Porter, and the Fitzhughes. Gibson is listed in the 1870 census as having property valued at $300, which is a lot, and $100 worth of personal wealth. His occupation is listed as a blacksmith. He is married with seven children. Robert Bradley and Joshua Ball, who like Morris Gibson, also purchased land from Robert Porter. Although Robert Bradley purchases land from Porter, he is listed in the 18th census as a resident, 1880 census, as a resident of Falls Church and not Maryfield. It can be surmised that these early residents of this African American community felt the need for their own house of worship. Although the exact date of inception is not known, what is known is that in 1874, Robert Bradley purchased land in Maryfield from Robert Porter. Oral history states several years prior to the land sale, this community of farmers and self-employed entrepreneurs gathered together to fellowship in homes, tents, and campgrounds to follow their religious convictions. It is also believed that Bradley obtained his land from Porter and allows these same worshipers to fellowship on this property. Officially in 1891 and recorded in 1892, Robert and Virginia Bradley sold for $1, 5,000 square feet of land to the trustees of First Baptist Church of Maryfield, John E. Coates, Joshua Pearson, and Joshua Ball. This land transfer, however, was not without stipulations that no portion or part of said parcel or tract of land shall ever be used as a burying ground. And that's why we do not have a burying ground today. By 1881, the black community had grown exponentially as blacks participated in a post-reconstruction migration from Arlington, West Falls Church, Gravel Bank, and the Hill and Falls Church. Whites such as Robert Porter, O.M. Hines, and E.M. Dunn continued to sell land parcels to blacks. In 1894, another deed of trust for First Baptist was created to, uh, created to correct land um, discrepancies. The trustees listed on the new deed were Johnny Coates, Joshua Ball, Joshua Pearson, William Stewart, and Albert Dixon. All of these trustees were members of the community and had been landowners between 1870 and 1880. As the church became a physical structure, its presence within the community became the umbilical cord for religious and educational instruction of African Americans in the Pines, which is located behind Fairfax Hospital, Williamstown, which is on Williams Road near here, and Maryfield. Most of the patrons lived around the church and their children attended the Maryfield Colored School in front of the church. And the Colored School is where the um, hotel is on Porter Road. And it was a two-room uh, wooden structure. This closeness allowed for networking, educational, and community support. Some of the early pioneering families of Maryfield were the Collins, the Lees, the Ransoms, Bradleys, Parkers, Blands, Gibsons, Robinsons, Heisons, Blackwells, Fishers, Burks, Turner, Middleton, Struthers, Lockett, Woodlands, Pearson, Ball, Stewart, and Dixon. was the one that my great-grandmother was a slave, but my grandmother was born during slavery time, which was the mother to, to, my, to my father. Uh, I knew every family in the, every house in this area, 
And uh, there was only two churches right in here. This church and the uh, white church sitting on the other side of Lee Highway up on the hill, which you could see from the, this area where we lived. Uh, there was a, uh, well, I'm going to put it this way there. Starting that at the corner down Lee Highway, there was a service station there, which a man named Wood owned. Mm -hmm. And then right surrounding that, going towards Falls Church, there was property that Sioni owned. They were a white, white family. And uh, coming back this way, there was a house on Gallus Road coming from that service station behind Sioni's was Collins. Joseph Collins owned that property. He, he, that was a deacon. He and the chairman of the board until he passed. And he, they eventually sold that house, well, to a Vaughn family from Christenburg, Virginia. So they were there, and he was raising his family. Right next door to that, there was a little lot in there, what was called Liberty Hall, which was, I think, by the time I was going, it was burned down, a tore down for the ladies. They had a little piece of property there, and then it was the, uh, the Blackwell family. The next to that house was Reverend Eugene Terry. And then after that, there was some property there. I think I once saw a trailer there, but the trailer was eventually disappeared, and then there was a house there owned uh, maybe by a man named Sam Farmer and his wife, Naomi. And uh, after that, then there was the schoolhouse, the one-room school where all the people around here went to that one-room school. My mother and Mrs. Pauline Terry Gray went to that one-room school. Will Johnson, Worthy Johnson, they owned the property next to us. He was a trustee at the old church. And uh, next to that, right at the corner here, around the road to you know, get to that, there was a lot that Mr. Bradley, who's the man that donated the land to the church, he still owned that property. Uh, and then there was a church, and across the street was my grandparents, uh, Jesse and Lee and Terry, they owned that property there. And the Blackwells owned property, Mr. Blackwell ran on the, uh, next to that. Then there, after that, that was the old school there. It was all backed up Sioni property. One room school where the only place to get an education is area. That's where I started out in that one room school. The old church. Yes, the old church. That's the church that I was raised in. Little old white churches that right over there. The old church began its humble beginnings with lumber, lumber purchased from the docks in nearby Alexandria, Virginia. William H. Collins Sr., who was the grandfather of Guy Collins, who we played his music for. So William H. Collins Sr. and Mr. Philip Luckett transported the building materials for, for the building by horse and wagon to erect the original wooden edifice, which was torn down, in, unfortunately, in the 1970s. A foundational platform was started and used as benches during worship services. Jenny Ransell, my grandmother, a young child, uh, during this time period spoke of having her feet dangle between the beams as she was young and her legs were short. After raising funds for siding rafters and a roof, a terrible storm destroyed the wooden structure, leaving it unstable. Never daunted, those believers in Christ simply rebuilt. It took another eight years from the, uh, from the storm to complete the reconstruction. However, once the rebuild was fully functional, a cornerstone was laid Bearing the year of the building, it was completed, but not the year that the church body was established. The date of establishment can be surmised as around 1870 to 1872. And I took this number from the number of land ownerships, the date of deeds, and the blacks that were living in the area. In 1917, a cornerstone was laid in the Blue Ridge Lodge of the Odd Fellows Hall. And for those of you who don't know, the Odd Fellows Hall is where Boyd's Piano sits today. It is really the only building that's left that's historically significant in, Fair, in, uh, in Merrifield besides this building. The date on the stone is September 30th, 1917. The purpose of this organization had many others. First and foremost, it was an organization for the men that provided a sense of agency within a society that saw them less than. One trustee of the hall was Harris Tinner. Tinner, a landowner, purchased five and a half acres off the Gallus Road in 1905. Harris uh, was the son of Charles Tinner, a prominent African American who was instrumental in the establishment of the African American community of Falls Church. 
And many of you who are natives or have been here a long time, you've heard of Tinner Hill. That's Charles Tinner. Charles Tinner's son, Paris, then came to Maryfield and helped establish parts of this community. Oral history for many of the residents of Maryfield stated that the Odd Fellows Hall, located on Gallus Road, Boy Piano, was an extension of a church and colored school. Its function served as a benevolent organization, overflow, normal school, and served as a black movie theater on weekends. Church and academic functions were held there, along with adult vocational classes. Lessons taught included hairdressing, sewing, and furniture making. Maryville, a smaller community than Falls Church, did not have an increase in black population until the 1900s, when the area known as the Pines, which is now called Pine Ridge Park, which is behind Fairfax Hospital, was developed. The Pines, an offshoot of Maryfield area, was home to Douglas Collins, Jenny Collins Ransell, William Robinson, Jerry Robinson, Bernard Ransell, Clarence Ransell, William Robinson, Elmer Collins, Joseph Collins, Norman Collins, William H. Collins, William H. Collins Jr., Stephen Fish, and the Slaughters. A search of land needs within the county shows that earliest residence within this black community was William H. Collins Jr., Guy Collins' father. When he purchased land in 1905, and he purchased land because he had acquired money from being a Buffalo soldier that rode with Teddy Roosevelt and went up San Juan Hill. Other family members purchased property once the Collins brothers established themselves. Many of these citizens lived in this enclave were members of the First Baptist Church of Merrifield and sent their children and grandchildren to the Merrifield Colored School. Similarly, another community that built a residence into the Merrifield area, the Baptist Church in the school, was Williamstown. Its founder, Seth Williams, along with his wife, seeing a need for blacks to have land ownership, purchased property in 1902. Subsequently, they sold small lots to blacks who could otherwise not find land within a segregated Fairfax. Notably, prominent African Americans living in Merrifield in the early 20th century were the Turners, Coates, Terrys, Johnsons, Tinners, Howards, Isons, Collins, Ransell, Johnson, Gibson, Gaskins, and Williams. Although between the years of 1874, when Robert Bradley purchased land in Merrifield and then sold it to the First Baptist Church in 1891, much is not known. Land records show the early property owners in this region were Joshua Ball in 1876, Johnny Coates in 1884, Joshua Pearson in 1886, Albert Dixon in 1899. The establishment of the Merrifield Osmelis Hall is listed as 1891. The word says that God adds to the church daily as he see fit, and he did so in such an abundance until we had to increase our services. In, in 83, there was one service when we came, and I think we was at approximately, approximately less than 200 members at that time, and by the time we had gotten to the year of 1988, we had to go to two services because of the growth of the congregation. There were so many ministries implemented till I doubt if I can find words to remember all of them, but I know one of the great ones that was implemented was the Child Care Center. And that's still going very strong at this time. Now, babies hold a special spot in the pastor's heart. I love the babies. Uh, the babies is our doing. What God has assigned us to do, but doing it in the right way. Yeah, we 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 saw the need to start the child care center because we had so many young people in the church at that time, and everyone was looking for places to leave their children in a Christian atmosphere. And the thought was that I'll go to God about this and let him direct me. And as he followed the leadership of the Lord, that was the directions in which he took him. And it turned out to be a blessing to so many people. We are a people that have been called out by God to carry out a specific function, to do a specific purpose for the Most High God. Uh, and when we cease to carry out God's purpose yeah. and God's will, that will
which God has blessed, uh -huh. all of a sudden can become cursed. Yeah. You know that we have been blessed, don't you? Yes, sir. How many of you know our history? Yes, sir. Do you know where the Lord has brought us from? Do I need to go back and recount incident after incident, chapter after chapter, situation after situation, movement after movement, problem after problem? Uh, do I need to recount that or can you stroll back down memory lane? Don't you remember that you used to be a slave, yeah. but now you're free? Yeah. Don't you remember how you used to be in the back, yeah. but now God has brought you to the front? Yeah. Don't you remember how you used to be the last, yeah. and now God has made you the first? Yeah. Don't you remember how you used to be behind, yeah. and now God has put you ahead? Reverend Charles L. Parker's uh, pastoralship, candidates for baptism were baptized in the chilly waters of the Akatee Creek near the bridge on Woodburn Road. However, during Reverend Parker's leadership, the congregation took on another building project to establish a larger edifice complete with fellowship hall and baptismal pool. Around 1952, a foundation was dug with a pool on the site of the present day First Baptist Church of Maryfield. So this is the original site that they dug the foundation in 1952. They built a pool, and for 13 years, they used just the bottom half of this building because there were no walls, there were no roofs, there was nothing. So we would go down into the basement, have baptism, have fellowship, but we still continued to have service in the old church. Members, small in number, and there were very few families that were attending there, were determined to raise money to finish the new church through prayer, dedication, chicken dinners, pageants, an apron fund, and a buying brick program. Thirteen years later, in 1965, these hardy uh, parishioners marched into this new structure, this structure, with Reverend C.L. Parker leading the way. Now, Reverend Parker did not drive. So he would catch the bus to Falls Church, and Sister Bessie Mae Gaskins, or either someone else would pick him up from down where the bank is at Broad Street, which was Route 7 and Washington Street, Washington Street, and Lee, that's called Lee Highway in certain parts of the city. And they would bring him up here to Maryfield Church, you know, on Sunday mornings. We must note that Maryfield has gone through eras of progress, from emancipation, reconstruction, the end of Jim Crow, the civil rights movement of the 60s, and the gentrification of the Mosaic District. It has since uh, had an increase in membership of over 500 active members. It has expanded its Christian education, community outreach, scholarship fund, and leadership uh, under Reverend Linwood Graham, who started a preschool. We must remember that it took a group of ex-slaves and free people with the courage to stand in their conviction through the storms of life, through the ills of segregation and the inequality of Jim Crow to persevere. And because of this, with God's grace, we stand today as one body in Christ, known collectively as the First Baptist Church of Maryfield. Um, the bell is an awesome bell. Um, it's a great reminder of First Baptist Church of Maryfield because can you imagine seeing this bell on top of this building? Um, Back in the early 1900s. Yeah, it's, that's quite a bit in itself. So it's great to have the bell itself. Vernon, thank you. Thank you. Okay. It does ring a bell. <laughs> And we had a big celebration when the bell was returned. Um, we had a rededication, and we asked one of our oldest members, um, Deaconess Gray, if she would be the person 
to uh, ring the bell. And in this picture, you can see her sitting by the bell. And it was under Reverend Keith Kitchen, who really was fundamental in getting the bell back um, from Maryfield Gardens. We have no idea how it wound up over there, but we were very, very glad to get it back. And I